Perhaps nothing represents the marvels and mysteries of ancient history more than the great monuments of the Egyptians. More than 4,500 years ago, ancient Egypt reached its height for the first time in the period of the Old Kingdom. This period saw the development of many of the things that we associate with ancient Egypt, like the idea of god kings, the use of hieroglyphics, and the construction of pyramids. Also called the Age of Pyramid Builders, the Old Kingdom saw some of the construction of the greatest monuments ever built by man. The pyramids of Giza are perhaps most famous, but the first pyramid was built more than a century before and represented a revolutionary break from tradition. The Old Kingdom saw the construction of the first pyramid, the construction of the last great pyramid complex, and most likely saw the construction of another great monument that is still surrounded in some mystery, the Great Sphinx. The age of the pyramid builders is history that deserves to be remembered. The Old Kingdom began with the rule of the Third Dynasty King Yozer, who ascended to the throne in the 27th century BC, although the exact date isn't certain. His rule would mark a significant departure from earlier Egyptian rulers. The earliest discovered life-size statue of an Egyptian is Yozer. There's some disagreement as to who preceded him or followed him as king, but he seems to have been a child of the last king of the Second Dynasty. How long he ruled is also a question, at least 19 years, but possibly as many as 30. His reign is so ancient that the historical sources often disagree, and experts have presented a variety of different conclusions. An important note is that the Egyptians didn't use the title Pharaoh until the 19th dynasty during the New Kingdom, but archaeologists still use the term to refer to all of the Egyptian kings starting with the First Dynasty. Gyozer was the first Egyptian king to be buried at Saqqara instead of Abdios, and may have been the king who officially moved the capital to Lower Egypt at Memphis. Djoser did send several military campaigns into the Sinai Peninsula, where a number of large stone monuments bear his name. The Third Dynasty also represented a period of wealth, internal peace, and prosperity for Egypt. Perhaps his most important legacy, however, is his pyramid. Prior to Djoser, the Egyptian kings were buried in mastabas, a kind of flat-roofed rectangular structure with sloping sides. The ancient Egyptian word for the structure means house of eternity, but the modern name comes from the Arabic word for stone bench or bench of mud. Built largely from mud bricks, the monuments were meant to protect Egyptian kings and elites from nature and grave robbing, as the survival of the corpse was incredibly important in Egyptian religion. The burial chambers themselves were cut deep into the bedrock beneath the mastaba. It was under Joseph's vizier, Imhotep, called in the inscriptions the head of the royal shipyard and overseer of all stoneworks, that the burial monuments of Egyptian kings changed to pyramids. You might recognize the name Imhotep because makers of the 1932 movie and its 1999 remake use that name, although not its history, as the name of the primary villain in the movie. Archaeologists think that Imhotep oversaw the construction of Yozer's pyramid. The structure was experimental from the beginning. It was built in several stages, representing changing visions during the construction. Initially, it resembled a mastaba, with a single level built like a mastaba, except that it was square instead of rectangular. Instead of mud bricks, the outer layer of the structure was made with cut limestone, making it probably the earliest stone structure in Egypt, and one of the earliest ever built by man. Mastaba-like structures were then built on top of each other until the final pyramid reached a height of 204 feet, with six steps. The step pyramid was surrounded by an enormous 37-acre complex filled with ritual buildings, and the pyramid itself is surrounded by the Great Trench, from which some of the limestone used to build the pyramid probably came. Yozer himself was buried in a three-mile underground maze, complete with false doors and false paths. Though no contemporary or later documents actually claim that Imhotep was in charge of construction at the site, the vizier was granted the rare honor of having his name mentioned in the inscription of one of Yozer's statues. A thousand years later, Imhotep would be deified and remembered as a physician, although no contemporary texts mention that he was any kind of doctor. The complex and pyramid set important precedents, and has been called a revolutionary conception that would influence the entire history of Egyptian architecture. The size and increased complexity of the pyramid and the surrounding complex speak to the kingdom's newfound wealth and control, both over manpower and natural resources. It also required improved technology, both in metallurgy and toolmaking, and more skilled stone workers than earlier mastabas. During the Third Dynasty and into the Fourth, general peace continued, allowing the king to devote its energies to the creation of enormous monuments. The first king of the Fourth Dynasty was Snefru, who mastered the art and engineering of pyramid building. He built the first true pyramids in Egypt, that is, ones that have smooth sides instead of steps. He is believed to have built three pyramids at Dashur, the 
Bent Pyramid, the Red Pyramid, and the Midum Pyramid. The Midum Pyramid especially exemplifies the shift from a step pyramid to a true pyramid, as it began as a step pyramid that later had limestone facing added that gave it the familiar smooth straight finish. After Snefru came the most famous pyramid builders, the kings who built the famous pyramids at Giza. These fourth dynasty pharaohs built these pyramids in the 26th century BC, largely with skilled, well paid, and free manpower and not slaves, as is often stated. But more mysterious than any of those pyramids is another monument at the site the Great Sphinx of Giza. Unlike the pyramids, no contemporary inscriptions mention the Sphinx or its construction. Although it's called a Sphinx, the name was only given to it thousands of years after it was built, after the Greek mythological creature which it resembles. The general consensus is that the Sphinx was built around 2500 BC during the reign of the pharaoh Khafra, who also built the second slightly smaller Giza pyramid and its complex. The Sphinx stands within the Khafra pyramid complex and its temple is built in an identical style to one of Khafra's. The Sphinx was carved directly out of the limestone bedrock. Today the original shape has been restored by adding layers of blocks to replace sections that have worn away. The Sphinx is the oldest known monumental sculpture in Egypt, 240 feet long from paws to tail and 66 feet tall to the top of its head. Many archaeologists assume that the face of the Sphinx is meant to be that of Khafra himself. Though most archaeologists believe the Sphinx belongs to Khafra, some Egyptologists argue that it is instead much older, dating it hundreds or thousands of years prior to the Egyptian Old Kingdom. If true, we don't know who built it or exactly how, but it isn't a new idea. 19th century Egyptologists such as Flinders Petrie thought the Sphinx could predate the Old Kingdom. Proponents argue that erosion of the Sphinx doesn't fit the mainstream timeline and that signs of water erosion push its construction to a time when the region was wetter. Another piece of evidence is the so-called Inventory Stella. The Stella, written about 1900 years after construction of the Giza Pyramids, is an inventory of statues owned by the Temple of Isis. And it claims that the Isis Temple was discovered abandoned near the Sphinx Temple when Khufu arrived. The Stella, however, has some notable anachronisms, including the fact that the temple appears to have been built well after the Old Kingdom ended, and most scholars dismiss it as an attempt by the temple to gain prestige. Supporters of the Old Sphinx theory argue that information on it could have been copied from earlier sources. Sometime after the 4th dynasty, the Giza complex was abandoned and the Sphinx was buried in sand up to its shoulders. Around 1400 BC, Pharaoh Tutmosis IV, not to be confused with Tutankhamun or King Tut, dug the sculpture out at least to its front paws, where he placed the Dream Stella, discovered in 1818. The Stella seems to refer to Khafra and tells the story of the dream the pharaoh had while napping in the sand below the sphinx's head. In the dream, he was told by the sun god Ra to unbury the sculpture. Tutmosis does seem to have made some repairs to the sphinx at the time, and it would see several other restoration efforts over the millennia. It may have been unburied again in antiquity, but the sand continued to rebury it until it was uncovered in the 20th century. The sculpture has been worn significantly over the millennia by the winds and sands of the desert, as well as rain. Many viewers have likely heard the story that Napoleon fired cannons at the buried Sphinx and knocked its nose off. However, that story is false. The nose was already missing in drawings in 1757, and modern examinations have determined that chisels were used to pry the nose off, possibly as long ago as 300 AD. A number of medieval Muslim sources attribute the damage to Muslim rulers. One says that a Muslim leader broke the nose off after finding local peasants making offerings to the sculpture around 1378. The 5th and 6th dynasties continued to build pyramids, but built them back at Saqqara and their pyramids tend to be smaller and are built with lower quality material. Later Old Kingdom pyramids did begin to include written accounts of the king's reign on the walls of their interiors. The last full pyramid complex built by the ancient Egyptians was built towards the end of the 6th dynasty by Pharaoh Pepi II, also at Saqqara. By this time, Pharaoh pyramids had taken on a standard size that was much smaller, less than 5% of the volume of the Great Pyramid. By the time of Pepi II, the leadership of the king was in significant decline. Governors who ruled as representatives of the king had been growing in influence for some time, and Pepi's mother was the daughter of one of these powerful governors. Pepi II is said to have had the longest reign of any Egyptian king at 94 years, although many scholars think it was shorter, closer to 62 years. His pyramid complex was still a significant undertaking. The pyramid stood less than half as high as the Great Pyramid, but it is connected by a 1,300 foot long covered causeway to a temple which sits on a key that was once a canal that connected the complex to Memphis. Three additional queen pyramids surrounded the complex, each with their own temples. Interestingly, despite his supposed long reign, there is evidence that the construction was rushed and that the material used to build it was of inconsistent quality. A wall built around the pyramid was actually meant to buttress the whole structure, which threatened to collapse in on itself. 
The sarcophagus also shows some obvious evidence that it was rushed and is partially unfinished. The pyramid complex itself has been heavily damaged and was long used as a quarry. Egyptian kings did continue to build pyramids on and off afterwards. The pyramid of an 8th dynasty king sits near Pepe's, but it is much smaller, closer to the size of Pepe's queen pyramids. Many of the later pyramids, built centuries after the pyramids of Giza, are in considerably worse condition than those famous examples. There's a reason for this. The pyramids of Giza are built of solid stone blocks all the way through, while most of the later pyramids are built with a core of rubble, limestone, or mud bricks, and only capped by stone on their exterior. In the millennia after they were built, later locals often used pieces of these monuments to build their own structures. Pieces of the limestone that once capped the pyramids of Giza, for instance, were used to build mosques. Pyramids continued to be built during the Middle Kingdom, and many were larger than Pepe II's, though most of them have been heavily quarried and are only ruins. The last pyramid built in Egypt by native rulers was built by Amos I, the first pharaoh of the 18th dynasty and the first king of the last golden age of ancient Egypt, the New Kingdom. The tradition of pyramids did continue, and many were built in southern Egypt by the Kushite kings of the 25th dynasty, along with other cultures. The three great pyramids at Giza have dominated most of the popular culture's vision of the monumental works of ancient Egypt, and that's not very surprising. They are the most enduring and today perhaps the most impressive examples of a deeply ingrained tradition. But that first step pyramid of Yozer is in many ways just as important. It kickstarted what would become the defining architectural theme for the next thousand years. The famous Sphinx represents ancient Egypt at its most mysterious. Different from the pyramids, but in the same class of monument, it continues to be as enigmatic as the Greek mythical creature that is its namesake. The pyramids and the monuments and the temples of the Old Kingdom are closely related both to the power and the culture of the time, and they give us insight into the changing world that those people faced. The ancient Egyptians could not have imagined this modern world whom their monuments continue to impress, but they do represent an enduring human desire to build something that will last so that people from a far removed time will see them and know that someone, someone important, came before them. I hope you enjoyed this episode of The History Guy, short snippets of forgotten history between 10 and 15 minutes long. And if you did enjoy, please go ahead and click that thumbs up button. If you have any questions or comments or suggestions for future episodes, please write those in the comment section. I will be happy to personally respond. Be sure to follow The History Guy on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and check out our merchandise on teespring.com. And if you'd like more episodes on forgotten history, all you need to do is subscribe.